Get your release. With Shrinks, the anonymous armchair chat show. How you feeling out there, everybody? Welcome to what we call Shrinked. And here on this program, we reach out to the global community where everyday folks can share their voices and say on a national and international platform what's really going on in their minds and their hearts, and also get a chance to share their feelings, concerns, challenges, whatever it is. This is that program where we can get that release that we all need every now and then. I'm your host, Jamal Aziz, a.k.a. TJ, and I got with me in the studio, Beijing psychotherapist, Mr. Liu. How you doing? Well, you know, I'm very tempted to say with the formulaic, <laughs> I'm fine, how about you? But today, I'm not going to say that because right. actually it's not been that great a day mm. because someone I care about deeply has been treated unfairly mm. and that bothers me. So, no, I'm not having a particularly great day. <laughs> and also, at the risk of going completely <laughs> off the tangent, uh-huh. um, I just want to remind our listeners that if in the future somebody asks you this question, you might want to be more accurate with your answer. Because if you do tell them uh, like how you actually are feeling, mm. this may be a great opportunity to get closer to that person, to have some meaningful discussion or conversation. And it will make you feel a lot better too, right? Exactly. So beautiful. I, I'm glad you said that because a lot of people just kind of return that statement and just say, I'm doing great, but really they're falling apart inside. So it's really great to be able to just say how you're really feeling. And today we want to address something that we all encounter on a daily basis, but sometimes it can get pretty foreboding when we reach certain crossroads or milestones in our lives. And this feeling has the potential to torment you or weigh you down like a barbell. And of course, I'm talking about something called making big decisions or the fear of change. So really interesting discussion. And I'm glad you're joining us today to hear about it. Now, folks, here on Shrinked, we believe that mental health awareness is not only helpful, but absolutely necessary for us to adapt, evolve, and survive in these trying times. So joining us on the show, we have a couple of practicing professionals in psychology, uh, including Mr. Liu, who will be giving some pointers to those who share their voices. And hopefully, for those of you listening out there, some of that advice will reach some of you out there listening if you're dealing with similar issues. And this is also a really good time to say that this show is not a substitute for seeing a licensed professional. So if anyone that you know is in dire need of psychological assistance, please reach out to someone in your area. That way you can be assessed based off of your particular needs. So now that we've got that out of the way, as we usually do, let's hear from our voice sharer. And of course, on this show, folks, most of the names that are given are pseudonyms for privacy concerns. So let's hear it. Hi. I'm Sasha. I'm 27 years old. I'm currently in China and I have a truly shocking number of fears for the rest of my life because I've gotten to the point where I need to start making decisions for the rest of my life and I've spent the last four or five years basically just hiding from those things. I came here and I make good money, I've got a good job and I'm going to there's part of me that feels like I'm throwing that away because I've decided to go back home and study further and I'm gonna get a PhD that I want just because it's probably not gonna benefit my life in any significant way it's just gonna make me less employable so I guess you could say I have a fear of not finding a well-paying job after I spend a fortune most of my savings paying for a PhD that I want to do full-time, my life's going to get significantly harder because I'm going to have to work a lot more on the PhD and on funding a life that isn't going to come close to the lifestyle that I've started to enjoy for myself because of the privilege of, you know, being in China and earning Chinese money. And I'm really scared about that. I'm really scared that I'm making the wrong decision and that I'm forcing myself into making this decision. But the thing is, I've wanted a PhD since I was a child. Like, I was seven, eight years old and I was like, I'm going to be a doctor one day. I'm going to be a doctor of history. I never planned to be a medical doctor. But I'm afraid of that and I have a lot of anxiety 
and I'm prone to depression and these things make it harder to be confident in my own decisions. I struggle a lot with the idea of being confident in my own decisions and because of that I don't sleep very well and I'm not eating very well and I'm struggling to regulate my emotions in ways that are helpful and useful and I have so many panic attacks that I've lost count. But I don't know that I can stay here any longer. You know, everywhere I look, people are losing their jobs. It's becoming more and more unwelcoming in some ways. And the spaces I'm in, everyone I love is leaving or has left or will leave. And there's no future for me here, but I probably could have gotten a couple more years of coasting out of the way. And then I look at my friends who didn't spend the last couple of years dicking around and they've got careers. They're not maybe happy, but they're established. You know, they're not moving apartments every year or every two years. They're not unsure of what they're going to be doing. And I'm afraid of making decisions and I'm afraid of not making decisions and I don't want to be a failure and I don't want to be a disappointment and I don't want to be a coward and I don't want to be boring. I don't want to live the rest of my life as a version of myself that is less interesting than the person that I got to become here. I don't want to undo my own becoming by going back. I'm afraid of going back. I'm afraid that making this decision means I'm going back. I can't guarantee it. And I, I really like having guarantees. I mean, who doesn't? And there are a lot of things that are hard about living here. It's lonely. It's isolating. There's a lot that's wrong with me that I need to work on. And I've been working on it, but... I don't know if I've been working on it hard enough, and I guess I'm afraid that I've just wasted the last four years of my life, you know, doing stuff that speaks to privilege rather than success. I've gone traveling, and I've seen the world, and all of that, but I don't have, I don't know if I have anything to show for it. As privileged as my life has been here, I'm still not happy and I don't know why I'm not happy and I don't know if I'm what I'm missing that's going to make me happy. Thank you so much Sasha for sharing something that's extremely nerve-wracking and I can completely identify with some of the things that she brought up and she mentioned quite a few things but the things that stood out to me personally were fear of decisions, of course change and failure. And Psychology Today defines some of these um, phobias as metathesiophobia. And also, there was another that I couldn't quite pronounce. So another name for it is decidophobia, which is pretty self-explanatory. And I've had my trips with it. Um, before coming to, well, leaving the United States, I had a big problem trying to decide what I wanted to do and if it was the right move for me. So. I was in a position where it was really tough. I was in the aviation industry and I had a really oh. good job. And I, you know, the pay was decent. And of course, you know, I could fly all kinds of places. And But there was just this hole inside. I, I didn't really feel that I was fulfilled in my life and my work. And I didn't see a future in this industry. So it was a really difficult time. And I felt that I wanted to get some international experience. Mm -hmm. And so I really struggled with that for quite some time. And, and of course, other people around me didn't think that it was a good idea to leave this type of job or this industry because it was uh, stable. It was stable, right? So I had a big decision to make and it was really uncomfortable. And I sat on that decision for about, I would say a year. But ultimately, I um, started to do a little bit more research and that kind of helped me to make a decision. And it still wasn't comfortable after I made it. But it made things a little bit easier. And this is something that has came back, I would say, again and again in my life, uh, changing majors. I was uh, initially a pre-med major. Mm. And so I was uh, on the road to be a doctor. But, you know, I had some I just had this feeling that I didn't really want 
to pursue it. And so I had to really think about it and I had to make a big change. And of course, the pressure from family to stay on that path was really, really intense, but I had to make that call. And so it's, um, it doesn't feel good to make these, uh, these big decisions, but unfortunately they're inevitable. You know, sometimes the consequence of staying is worse than the fear of the unknown. So yeah, at some point you just, you have to make these, um, these kinds of uh, decisions. Yeah. So actually, I agree with all of the keywords you have singled out so far. But I would say my number one impression after listening to that clip is that Sasha is extremely eloquent. Mm. Like she knows her problems so well. And that's actually representative of a very common type of client that I come across in psychotherapy. So they all have this tendency they have a lot to say. <laughs> and once they open their floodgates, yeah. like there's no stopping them. Floodgates, so, I like that. Yeah. So I have a feeling that this is because they have been bottling things up for too long. Hmm. So obviously they need this outlet. Once they finally find that outlet, it's just naturally coming out. So my suggestion to Sasha would be, while it's a very good thing that she could share her anxiety, share her worries with us on this program, hmm. that's certainly a good thing but it's just a one-time thing. I feel like she probably needs a more systemic support system. Hmm. So it would be a good idea for her to try psychotherapy if she hasn't already. So that's my number one impression. And the number two impression is that, although I'm not 100% certain because we have limited information here, yeah. I have a sense that she probably has this analysis paralysis problem. So this concept, analysis paralysis, it basically refers to an inability to decide due to overthinking a problem. Mm. So this concept originated in economy and business. And if it originally refers to the fact that you are faced with a whole lot of investment options, mm. like option A, option B, option C, and you look at all of them, and each of them has its own advantages and disadvantages. Right. And because you're constantly weighing pros and cons, pros and cons, in the end, you cannot decide which option to go with. Mm. So this started out in economy and business, but because it's so applicable in other areas of everyday life. Right. Yeah, it's just widely used, especially in psychology. It's really understandable because there's just so many factors that make making decisions very, very difficult. And recently there was a study from, I believe it was the University of Tokyo, and they assessed how a lot of changes in people's fears um, that are brought on mainly by the pandemic recently. And a lot of these uh, changes or a lot of these fears, some of the top concerns that people had was uh, fear of the unknown, which we kind of talked about a little bit earlier, uh, social isolation, hypochondriasis, which I find to be interesting, uh, disgust, information-driven fear, and compliance. And the reason why I think this study kind of applies to uh, decision-making is because sometimes your decisions can be influenced by a lot of the things that's going on around you. For example, I mentioned fear of the unknown. If you just don't know how things are going to turn out, when I was on the plane to come to, uh, well, China, I mean, there's a lot of things going on through my mind because of all the things that people told me. I mean, you're aware that, you know, China doesn't necessarily have good representation in, you know, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so people there have certain opinions. And when I was in, you know, South Korea, they had their opinions. So mm -hmm. I was a nervous wreck when I was on my way over here. You know, so the unknown, it's like, it's like you're jumping into this ocean where you can't see anything and you don't really know what's underneath the water. I mean, it was a really scary experience, but needless to say, I'm still treading water, you know, and I'm still here. So it, it's not as bad as it appeared to be. And uh, social isolation, I mean, a lot of us aren't able to go and, you know, be as social as we once were. We are not, we're not able to travel. And that, for some people, including myself, is very difficult. I thought hypochondriasis was interesting. And this is where people feel that They're they sick. are sick. And, of course, when with this pandemic and with people around that are, you know, when they sneeze or when they cough or when you catch a cold, you have this feeling like, you know, 
you know, should I go here or should I go there? I don't think it's a good, wise move. Like me, I'm, I would like to go home and see my family. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know uh, what the pandemic situation is out like and if I'm going to be able to come back. And all of these different decisions are clouded with all of these factors in life. And so I can understand why for Sasha, she, when she was sharing her, her some of the concerns that she has, I was right there with her on the, you know, you mentioned um, the floodgates, mm-hmm. you know, just I was right there with her because I could feel some of the concerns that she has because I, I go through them as well. Yeah. And I think your example is also a very good lesson for all of us, especially for Sasha, because when you fear the uncertain, I guess you will always feel anxious because you have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah. But interestingly, in social psychology, Psychologists keep saying that the only way to battle that kind of fear is to actually get closer to that thing you fear. Mm. So once you encounter it, once you actually deal with it, it's no longer that fearful. Right. Yeah. So I guess the best way is just to, in your case, just to come here to China Mm -hmm. and actually experience the country by yourself and all those stereotypes and all those nasty so-called opinions be (laughs) damned, right? So in Sasha's case, you know, she might have to actually go over there and actually pursue the doctoral degree and then she will know is it really that scary or is that scare just, you know, in her mind? Right. And so and you mentioned something very important and that was this little bit getting a little bit more exposure can help. And for me, it helped me a lot when I was leaving the aviation behind and coming into education. When I did more research and when I was able to secure a position um, abroad, it helped my anxiety to go down like a little bit more. And then when I found out that they were going to accommodate me this way and that way, so my anxiety went down even more. So sometimes just exposing yourself to a little bit of what concerns you the most and you find out, you know, there's going to be some truths, there's going to be some falsehood. But either way, you're going to have to expose yourself to it to really know if it's going to be as bad as they say it is or as bad as you think it is. But a lot of times it's not. Yeah. And also, I think I would like to steal that slogan from Nike. I think it's a very useful tip here. It's actually just, you know, just do it. Just do it. We have all heard it. And I know this sounds like overly simplifying things. But if you think about it, like in Sasha's case, she mentions that she is worried if she spends the next few years trying to pursue this doctoral degree. And after she does get the degree, Mm. will she be able to get a job? You know, that kind of concern. It's very legit. However, just because this concern is there, it doesn't mean that if she doesn't pursue this, this concern will disappear. It's still going to be there. So you might as well just go ahead and do it now because the longer you wait, this worry, this fear will only amplify. That's right. And that difficulty will also be more heightened in the future. So why not now? Absolutely. Beautifully said. So after sharing Sasha's voice with uh, some of the professionals, we forwarded this concern to Dr. Carl Anthony, and he's a clinical psychologist who resides and has worked in Asia for the past 17 years. And we're certainly privileged to have him collaborating with us on the show. So let's hear what he has to say. Hello, Sasha. How are you? Uh, My name is Dr. Carl, and I am a clinical psychologist. I'm from the USA, uh, the city and state of New York, and I've had an opportunity to uh, listen to your concerns, and I am hopeful that the advice that I will give you today will in some way be helpful. Uh, What you are experiencing is what uh, we call atychophobia. All of you are American, we would say atychophobia which is the persistent and irrational fear of failing. Uh, Let me just say that failure is something that we all have to deal with. However, when it consumes our lives, then it becomes a problem. And so what can one do about atychophobia? Well, first and foremost is uh, one should identify and clarify his or her thoughts. Okay, also feelings and actions. This is important because understanding and pinpointing why you're afraid of failing and how failing might truly affect you helps you face a fear of failure. Okay, 
This is insightful because once you identify precisely how the fear of failure is impacting your life and your behavior, uh, then you can do something about it. Okay, so that would be the first thing that I would advise. Secondly, I think it's also important for you to shift your perspective. Okay, an important part of overcoming any fear, okay, whether it's uh, fear of spiders, fear of failure, is to develop a perspective about the idea of failure. Instead of seeing failure as an absolute life-destroying disaster, develop a relationship with it, okay? It's kind of looking at failure, instead of seeing it, as I just said, to be an absolute, think of it as temporary. Think of it as a challenge, okay? A, a minor setback, or rather than an all-consuming, life-changing event that cannot be reversed. The third bit of advice I would give would to say, give yourself permission to fail. When we give ourselves permission to do something, it's a bit more acceptable. And so accept the fact that everyone at some point in his or her life will fail, okay? But as I said a second ago, okay, think of it as a challenge, an obstacle that you weren't successful at maybe the first time around, but you'll get it the second time around. Uh, the fourth thing I think you should try to do is uh, take control. Sometimes dread of failing looms large when tasks or goals or life expectations uh, become overwhelming. So break them down, right? Break them down in chunks. And in this way, you can control each individual action, each individual situation, and hopefully it'll make it a little bit easier, okay? It can also help you to reflect on aspects of success, which is important. Don't always just focus on failure or the idea of failing. And also try to focus a little bit on all the wonderful things that you have accomplished and the things that you would like to accomplish going forward, okay? So that's important. And uh, the fifth thing I would say is be mindful and distance yourself from your fears. This is not easy because when we constantly have the idea of failing in our minds, it's a little difficult to escape that. Uh, not because of anything that is really surrounding you, but your mind is in a place where it is telling itself, okay, you're not going to be successful at this. You're not going to overcome this. From listening to your concerns, I, I must say that you seem as if you have done some incredible things in your life, okay? You're in another country, you are doing well, you are open to do a PhD. Uh, it appears to me that failure is not something that you are familiar with. The fear of failure is something that I think you are truly concerned about. But as I said before, just take it one step at a time. Try to not let the idea of failure consume you and try to surround yourself with individuals who are positive, okay? Positive thinking really, really helps. Also, another thing that I think will be helpful is to accept the inevitability of failure in some instances. So please, I hope that this advice will be helpful it was really great listening to your concerns and um, have a wonderful day. Thank you. And we'd like to thank Dr. Carl Anthony for his words of support and suggestions. Earlier, I was trying to define what decidophobia was, and I, I couldn't actually pronounce the, the real term, and he, he pronounced it uh, with his advice, and that was a ticophobia. A ticophobia, yes. <laughs> right. And it's really scary, as I mentioned before. It it really haunts me um, as well. I've got a lot of things that I'm aiming for, and I can't say that I've achieved all of them yet. And uh, depending on how well things are going, especially on uh, a financial front, um, it could compromise a lot. So I tend to dwell on things, and it messes with my mental state as well. I've got some pretty high expectations for myself, and I think that uh, from Sasha's recording, she does too. And in reality, it's good to have high expectations of yourself, but sometimes it can also be a source of misery as well. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Because in theory, if you have high expectations, 
that usually means you are a very conscientious person.、Hmm. Because if you're not, then you will naturally, in Chinese, we would say "tang ping" or "lie flat." You will just take whatever <laughs> <laughs> that's out there. You won't make any efforts. So you, when you actually have expectations, that's always a good sign. However,、hmm. the key word is degree. If you have too high expectations of yourself. That becomes a strain, and that stops you from actually realizing your potential. Yeah. yeah. So just pay attention to the degree. Now I have to say that of all the great tips Dr. Carl Anthony has mentioned, the phrase that really stood out for me personally is "permission to fail."、Mm. That really grabbed me and would、yeah. never let go, because obviously I'm also a practicing、uh, psychotherapist. And some of my clients, especially those with neurosis,、mm -hmm. they're often wound up too tight. So they have exactly the same problem. They do not allow themselves to do or experience or explore certain things.、Mm -hmm. And among those things, failure is number one on that list. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. And this is highly related to uh, uh, another phenomenon called helicopter parents. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar、okay. with this term, right? So that refers to parents who are always hovering around their kids. Right. They try to interfere every chance they have. Like you have to be this, you have to do do it that way. Well, this in essence deprives their kids of the the chances to make mistakes. Right. But if they do not make mistakes, then do, they do not have the opportunity to learn from their mistakes,、right. to grow up, to be more responsible, to mature. So yeah, I really think you should sometimes just let go and stop trying to manipulate, control every yeah, situation. Yeah, control every situation. Yeah, he said developing a relationship with failure, and that that spoke to me as well, and not seeing it as absolute. Uh, sometimes it is not. Sometimes it's it's a process of life. It's how we all grow, and it really brings me back to to a poster that I've had on my wall. You know, when I was growing up, I look up to Michael Jordan. Yeah, we and, all do.、Uh, <laughs> right, and he had a a poster where he goes into detail of all the failures that he's had in his career. You know, all the amounts of shots that he missed, the game-winning shots, and all of the times where he was supposed to、uh, perform and it didn't work out, and all the games that he lost, and all of this. And he said, "I fail, and I fail, and I failed over and over again, and that's why I succeed." And for a long time, I didn't really understand the gravity of that statement. But as I got, you know, a little bit older, and I've had my my failures as well, I was like, wow, that's a you know a beautiful statement because we have to fail. I mean, it's part of you know, it's how we get our confidence, it's how we get our momentum, and it's how we adapt, it's how we get better. And so that was,、um, I think, that his、um, his advice for developing a relationship with failure, and not seeing it as a negative thing, just see it as, oh, okay, well, I tried this way, it didn't work. I knocked on this door, it didn't work, so I just had to try another one.、Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So this reminds me of a very similar quote. It's also very popular among athletes. Something to the effect of. So I failed this time. No matter. Next time, I will probably fail again. No matter. But I will fail better. <laughs> I just always love that. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you have this kind of mindset, you know, these calls or these, you know, big decisions that you have to make will get a little bit easier. It's not. It's never easy peasy. But you're going to. You're still going to struggle with perhaps knocking on the wrong door. And it, you know, I think setbacks is probably something else that is really tough and something that none of us want. And sometimes we can make a choice that will set us back for quite some time. And if you are an ambitious person like、uh, Sasha,、um, I think some of these setbacks are unacceptable, right? Or is there is perceived to be unacceptable?、Mm -hmm. So for those of you listening out there, we were actually able to reach out to one more professional, and joining us today is Thomas Markerson, a certified clinical psychologist working out of Copenhagen, Denmark. And of course, we're happy to have him as a guest expert on our show. So let's hear what he has to say. Hi, Sasha. It's been intriguing to hear you talk about your situation, and I can sense the pain. Fortunately, I may have some pointers for you that you may be able to use. First of all, let's talk about decision making. You talk about having spent four to five years, perhaps hiding from decisions. You talk about being prone to depression and anxiety, and which makes you less confident in your own decisions. As far as I understand, you have also decided to go back home and follow a PhD route, and at the same time, you worry that that's the wrong decision. What I've noticed is that you are very well composed. 
you have a great vocabulary and you're great at articulating your thinking. And this is an interesting cocktail because oftentimes when people are really good at thinking, they may be bad at decisions because making a decision is a whole body kind of activity. It entails your senses, your emotions, your feelings. And so it seems to me like you, you are prone to overthinking. And there is one great tool for you to use here. And that is to write a diary in which you write down five to 10 experiences per day. It may be totally banal experiences like going to the supermarket. And then you write for emotions how you felt these different things. And you always have to make sure that there is a, an overweight of positive words for emotions. Doing this and uh, aligning yourself with your body and recognizing all these different emotions in you makes you more attuned to your emotions and your intuitions. And that will make you better at making decisions. Second of all, you mentioned many panic attacks and that obviously feels awful. But there may be a very simple explanation for this because when you keep many doors open, when you consider many alternatives at the same time, your brain gets inundated with information. And what happens when the brain gets inundated with uh, different options all the time, it gets stressed and it often reacts with panic attacks. So when you get better at making decisions, the panic attacks will subside. You mentioned that you don't want to be a failure, a disappointment, and you don't want to be boring. And it's very important for you to be interesting. But that's a very abstract value. It's difficult to steer your life based on a value that has something to do with what other people may think of you. Uh, because what other people think of you depends on all kinds of things. You may even become so interesting to some people that you become uninteresting to others. You may be stood talking to a Nobel Prize winner one day and feel desperately uninteresting. And as the Vikings say that it's a lucky man who dies with a good reputation because you can never know what people think. So having this value that I need to be interesting is very abstract and doesn't really pose a great route through life. Uh, I suggest you read up on some of the great books written by Brené Brown, who writes a lot about the importance of accepting yourself. Then let's talk about this theory about what it is to become an adult. Becoming an adult doesn't hinge on you being 100% sure of which route to take. Becoming an adult is connected with realizing that you can't become everything. And it's a difficult proposition for young, uh, intelligent, extroverted, adventurous people because closing doors and missing and not taking opportunities feels bad. It's a bit sad, really. But becoming an adult has to do with the courage to realize that you can't become everything. Then you're talking about you're seeking stability, but you're afraid of becoming a boring person if you become too stable. Just listening to you describe your situation I don't think you can become boring even if you tried. Sasha, I think you're gonna have a great life. You just have to have the courage to go one way and see what's around the corner. And then when you see what's around the corner, then you have the courage to go further to the next corner. Because the fact of life is that we never know what's around the next corner. I'm sure that you'll be doing okay with what you do. And again, we'd like to thank Thomas Markerson for sharing his voice and advice on the program. I thought this was an interesting concept of closing doors. You know, most of us, myself included, like the pliability of having a lot of different options. But right. as Thomas mentioned, you know, uh, sometimes when you have too many options, and you mentioned a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. too, it makes it a lot harder to make a decision because you know you just have so many different things that you can choose from and so it's just you're flooded with options so it's really tough so closing some of those doors and again i can try to implement this a little bit more in my life but this could be a good way to start yeah i think that's a good point and also to a certain extent i feel like this particular piece of advice from thomas sounds like the classic saying less is more yes so sometimes you need to shut a few closed doors mm. sometimes you need to close a few doors yes that's really important and i think when you are closing these doors it's probably a good idea to stick to those opportunities that you absolutely cannot live without, you know, because sometimes there's opportunities that just sound good, but 
you don't really need them. I mean, it's just something that sounds nice, but the ones that really resonate in you and just are really close to your heart, maybe those are some of the options that you want to keep close. Yeah. I have to say something else Thomas mentioned really spoke to me. Mm. That is, he mentioned the keyword boring. He said something like, boring is a very vague and abstract concept yes, or value. Right. So don't make decisions because you don't want to become a boring person. I think that's sound advice. And so what, Sasha, you should do instead is actually trying to make decisions because you want to do something. Yes. Because it is something you have always liked. For example, history. You have always liked this and you have always wanted to pursue a PhD degree in history. So do that because you want it, not because others will perceive you as boring if yes. you don't. Uh, when you say, I want to pursue this because I have liked this, because this gives me intrinsic sense of satisfaction, mm -hmm. that means you're leaving the fate in your own hands. You're not leaving this decision to other people. But if you make the decision because you don't want others to, to perceive you as boring, you're leaving your fate in someone else's hands. Absolutely. And you can never control other people's perception. That's right. Being you know, comfortable in your own skin is, uh, is huge. You know, being able to embrace your own you know, representation of yourself, you know, regardless of what other people think. And I think this takes serious practice. And the reason why is because ever since we were kids, when we were out in the playground, and we've always heard other kids comparing and teasing us and picking out differences. And so we're always concerned about what other people think. And, that, and unfortunately, we carry that into adulthood and sometimes throughout an entire lifetime, you know, just worrying about what other people think and how different. And so really just being comfortable about who you are and what it is that you want and what you're here for, you know, your purpose and in doing that, those expectations that other people have of you, and if you're able to shed that off, it's just so much more liberating. You would feel lighter, I would think. Yeah. I also got really excited when Thomas mentioned the name Brene Brown because mm. she is such an influential figure in my life. So, Sasha, I would suggest that you try her latest book. It's called The Atlas of the Heart. It talks about 87 emotions and experiences that define what it means to be human. Hmm. So after reading this book, you will realize that all of these worries, the concerns, the anxiety, they are just absolutely normal. They tell you one thing, you are human. <laughs> So, Sash, if you're listening out there, I hope at least one takeaway that you can get from all of this is that success is relative. And so defining that is really key in being able to look at ourselves as adequate. And from where I'm standing, you sound very successful and rich with experiences. And not many people can say that they've had some of the experiences that you had, especially in education, because I don't have a PhD and I'm certainly not pursuing one, but I think everyone has a great deal of respect for people who are getting one. So I would say go for it. Yes. And one final point I would like to add, Sasha mentioned the word privilege a few times in her voice concern. Yeah. I just think that's very interesting because apart from financial privileges, I think knowing her passion about history is also a privilege mm. because, you know, there are so many people out there. They have been trying to pinpoint that passion their entire life, yet they somehow don't seem to find it. So the fact that she knows that about herself when she is so young, I think mm. that's a privilege for sure. So she should take advantage of this. And change is inevitable. We all have to roll with it. And it is painful. Um, changing careers was for me. I mentioned before before that I was in education and here in China education industry is very lucrative and when I switched up and went to media it was a huge pay cut not quite sure I'm over that yet but <laughs> it's something that you know it's a decision that I had to make and I don't regret it and I haven't looked back since so it's painful but so is staying in the same place as well mm -hmm. some would say suffering is ordained so if we're going to suffer, we may as well suffer in the way of our dreams, right? Yeah, bravo. <laughs> so for those who've made it to the end, that wraps us for this episode of Shrinked. And folks, we're actively pursuing more voice contributions for the show. So if any of you would like to share anything or get something off of your chest, please reach out to us and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And we hope your day gets a little bit brighter after listening in and be sure to join us next time for more sessions. I'm Jamal Aziz. I'm Liu Yan. Take it easy, folks. We'll see you next time. Thank you.